Hello, my name is Jim McKeith. Thank you for joining me for getting the most out of Embarcadero Prism and what's new in Prism XE2. Like I said, my name is Jim McKeith. I'm a developer evangelist for Rim Object Software. Rim Objects is the company that makes the oxygen compiler that powers Embarcadero Prism. A short agenda for what I'm planning to cover with you. I'm going to do a little quick introduction of Prism, but then I'm going to go into some of the stuff that's new in Prism XE2, like IDE productivity enhancements. We'll also talk about some powerful language features that a lot of people might not be aware of or exactly what they do, and these will really help you to be more productive and to get more out of Prism. Also, we're going to talk about Prism and Delphi interoperability. This is something a lot of people want to take advantage of because they do have both Prism code and .NET code, and they want to bring those together and to get the most out of those. And lastly, I'm going to give you a sneak peek of using Prism to develop Metro apps for Windows 8. And I hope you're not a big fan of slides, because that's it for slides for now. We're going to just jump into the IDE and get started here. The first thing you're going to notice here is I'm running Visual Studio 11 beta. So this looks different than the installation you got with Rad Studio XE2. Everything I'm going to show you, though, will work with Rad Studio XE2, with the exception I'm going to show you Metro support, which is the new application type that comes with Windows 8. Um, but everything else will work just the same in the current version of Prism XE2 that came with Rad Studio, or if you got XE2, Prism XE2 separately. Also, though, if you do want to get access to this latest version and run it in Visual Studio 11, you can register your serial number with rimobjects.com, which I'll give you the link for that at the end, and that will give you access to the beta builds of Oxygen for .NET, the compiler that powers Prism XE2, and then that will give you access to be able to run it in Visual Studio 11. So if you do want to start building Metro apps today, you can take advantage of that. One thing I do want to point out here in Visual Studio is under the help there's this show rim objects Everwood welcome screen. Now the first time after you run Visual Studio after installing Prism, you're going to get a screen similar to this. And this screen is going to show all the products by rim objects that are installed in Visual Studio. These two are the ones that come with Prism XE2. So this is, we're going to focus mostly on Rim Objects Oxygen for .NET. Now I also have the entire suite, and so I have Oxygen for Java here as well. I'm not going to really talk about getting to that in detail, but I will point out something that's really cool: is that with Oxygen for Java and Oxygen for .NET, you can have the same code that can compile to both .NET and Java, which is pretty amazing if you think about that. You can have code compatibility between. Oxygen and Delphi, and so you can have the same code built for pretty much every platform under the sun at that point, really. You can build it for native Windows applications, native uh, native code on the Mac, you can build it for iPhones, you can build it for Android phones, you can build it for Linux, Windows, you can build Java server faces, I mean just everywhere you want to go, you can do that with your favorite programming language now, if you have Delphi, Oxygen for .NET, which comes with Delphi Prism, and Oxygen for Java. So that's really the most I'm going to talk to you about, really about Oxygen for Java, but I do want to point out that that is just really amazing if you do want to take your existing code and just give it more life and reach more platforms. It's pretty amazing stuff. So I'm not going to get into uh, Data Abstract at all or Rim Objects SDK. Those are some products available from Rim Objects. You can check those on our website. But I will talk a little bit about Hydra later, which is an amazing tool that lets you uh, just take advantage of both Delphi and .NET in the same application. Really amazing stuff. I really think all Delphi developers should have Hydra because it just it increases the life of your code and the power and potential of what you can do so much. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But that's also a separate product from Rim Objects. So like I said, mostly going to focus on Oxygen for .NET. So the reason you might want to come back to the screen if you've checked the box that says don't show this to me again the first time you see it is if you click on each of these it brings up this screen here which gives you access to all the samples so you can come in here and select, select, different, camp, select different categories of samples and then open the samples either click the button or double click on it here also you can click a, a video check out introduction video 
which I'm not going to go into the details of what's in that video because you can go watch that video. And that video is going to give you a, an introduction of using Prism in general. So I would recommend you check that video out. You can also watch this video by going to rimobjects.com slash TV and check out Channel Oxygen from there. And you can find that video and quite a few other videos as well. And then lastly, I want to point out the documentation wiki at wiki.oxygenlanguage.com or just click this link and it'll take you there. That's going to have the most up-to-date documentation on Prism XE2 as well as the Oxygen language in general. So you can, you can click this link to get there or visit the website. So that's pretty much all I'm going to cover as far as just general Prism information and Vi Visual Studio 11 information. Everything else, and let's go ahead and get into some specifics of some specific things about Prism now. Sometimes when I'm writing code and just really flying along, I'll make a typo. I actually probably make it more often than I'd like to admit. And occasionally I don't catch it right away. There's a new feature in XE2 that actually makes it easier for you to find these typos and also to keep carry on while you're working with them. And what I'm going to go ahead and show you here is the compiler spell checking which probably find will make you a whole lot more productive. We're going to go ahead and create an instance of our foo class we have declared up above. Except, you notice here I've added a third O in there. So it's not spelled correctly. But let's say I didn't notice that and I go on and carry on. Now normally when you do this, and if I type F and then hit period, it's going to say, I don't know what type F is and it doesn't know what to, what to give me. And so then at that point I'd be like, I'd stop what I'm doing and be like, what's going on? and you have to figure out that I made a typo. But now I want you to notice this. I'm going to hit the period. And you notice it gave me bar, my bar property, without knowing the type of F, because F is of a different type. It's foo's misspelled. And what happened is behind the scenes there's a spell checker, and that spell checker said, you know what? He probably meant foo with two O's, not foo with three O's. And so it just assumes for me that I've made, selected that type. Um, so now I can go ahead and select bar and carry on. Now, I can have lots of properties and methods on foo, my foo class, and I can reference all of those with the F identifier, even though it's pointing to the wrong type. But now when I hit build, so at this point I've stopped, and said, okay, my code's good, and I hit build. Now it's going to tell me, it's going to say, hey, unknown identifier foo. That's what we expect it to do, right? Tell me when I've made a mistake. But also notice, it didn't give me an error message on this bar line, because it already assumed that it is of, it's going to be corrected, the, the type's going to be corrected. If that functionality wasn't there, other compilers would give you a list of errors, because it doesn't know what type F is, and so it would say, I, I don't know what to, if F has a bar method or not, bar property or not, so it'd give you an error there. But also notice right here this magic wand. This magic wand is part of the new fix it functionality we have. So I click on that and it says fixes and it lists possible fixes for this error. So this is where it makes a lot of sense for a compiler to do this because compiler is really good at telling you what's wrong and a lot of times it tells you what's wrong and it's like well that's really obvious why can't it fix it you know. Now it can. You just click here and it fixes that error for you. So in the place you can see this is not only in error messages but also in warnings. So we have warnings in place if I change the ca case of this. So now it's lowercase instead of uppercase and hit build. There's a warning on that saying the case for identifier doesn't match original case. Now you can turn that warning on or off. And interestingly, I actually had a conversation with Chuck J back when he worked for Borland and he said he wanted to have that functionality in there. I think that was Chuck J actually, I think about it. But he wanted to have the functionality that you could get warnings for having the case wrong. So now I get a warning on this. I click here and it gives me the option to just have a single click to fix that. Now there's a number of other situations where this fix it functionality is there. And you always know it's there because of the little magic wand. And sometimes there will be multiple fixes available to you. And so that balloon will pop up and it'll list all the fixes. And you can say, ah, this is the one I want. You click on it and it'll fix it and go along. So the great thing about this, especially the spell checker, is it lets you carry on. When you're in the flow and the code's just coming out, you don't have to worry about the fact that you typed the name, the, the type wrong because it assumes that you've spelled it correctly. And then later when you stop the flow and you go to hit build or compile or run or whatever is when it'll tell you, hey, you made a spelling mistake up here. I assumed it was this, but I just wanted to make sure. And that's so you can tell it, yeah, you're correct or 
change it. And of course, then you may have other things that you need to change. But most of the time, it's going to find what you're looking for. You, If you slaughter the type completely, it might not be able to figure out what you're trying to spell. But usually, I found it's pretty good at figuring out what I was trying to spell and then offering the correct for, correction for me. Sometimes just knowing what line and error on really isn't enough information. So you see here I'm doing a comparison of a few different types and of course you probably see the error right away, but let's assume that I somehow missed that, which, you know, in much more complex logic statements, that can happen. So I go ahead and hit build. And it says type mismatch cannot find operator to evaluate system int32 and system char. And it tells me that it's comparing, see a little underline here, P1, P2, and P3. So this is where the comparison that fails is the AND between these two types. And so it tells me the N32 is here and the ch char is there. So it gives you much more information. So if you can imagine having a much m larger, much more complex if statement here with lots of different clauses, well, probably it should be refactored, first of all. But second of all, it happens. Now we know exactly what's failing in here. So I'm going to go ahead and fix this and add the parentheses in here that I need. And hit build again. And look at that. We got another error message because we can't compare a car, char and a byte. So again, this is more useful as well because I don't know if the, it just told me the line. I wouldn't know if it was this comparison or this comparison that's failing. So now it's telling me that it's this comparison. There's my char, there's my byte, and that's the comparison that's failing. So that's very, very useful to be able to jump to exactly where the problem is. Another new feature that was added was uh, error notes here. So I'm going to go ahead and add another method. And it happens to have the same no name as my other method. So I'm going to go ahead and hit build. And you see I get an error message here is duplicate method foo with same signature. Now imagine that this one, I'll go ahead and do that, move this up to the top. Of this class. So I don't see it, right? It's hidden off the screen. Let me comment this out since, since we're not using it right now. And so duplicate method foo is same signature. Now I'm looking at this and this could be a large complex class and I'm like, I don't see another method. So there's another error or the error is on this line because this is the duplicate, but there's not enough information on this line to know what the error is. But now if I click on this and bring up this, um, the bubble here, it shows me a note that says previous declaration was here. So I click on that, show it, tell me it's on line 13. I click on it and boom, there we go. Here's the previous error. And so now it's like, oh, now I see I have enough information to fix this error. So that's really useful. And there, this is just one, you know, kind of contrived example, but you can obviously see this happening in production code. But there's lots of other places where it will say, hey, and give you a note pointing you to another place. So it tells you where the other problem is that's causing the error message. Very, very useful feature when you're writing a lot of code. Prism ships with the Visual Studio shell. So that gives you a free version of Visual Studio if you don't already have it. But if you do already have the Pro version or higher, so if you're doing some C Sharp or VB development, for example, then it will install into your existing Visual Studio. Now, when you first install the full version of Visual Studio, it asks you how do you want to set up your environment, what kind of development you want to set it up for. And so if you already set it up for C Sharp development and now you want to switch it over to do Prism development, I'm going to show you how you can do that. It's under the Tools menu here. You have this Import and Export Settings. So if you come in here, you can just export your environment settings or import your environment settings or reset. So reset gives you the option to go back to one of the predefined sets of collections or collections of settings. So I'm going to go ahead and reset. I want to save this as uh, Jim. And so now this is the list of different collections of environment settings that you can choose from when you first start Visual Studio. So now I can reset this back. So this could be either I'm changing from doing c -sharp development to Prism development, or maybe I was customizing my Prism development and I really messed it up and I didn't make a good backup beforehand, so I'm going to come back here and reset it again. So this is how you do that. You just come in here and select Oxygen Development Settings, and it will switch all your environment settings back to the predefined set for Oxygen. I'm not going to do that right now, but let me show you how you could customize the environment settings further to make yourself more productive with Oxygen. 
So let's assume I made a backup of my environment settings already using export. And then I come down here to options. And then I find environment keyboard and I come in here and type in oxygen. So this is going to show me all the commands relating to oxygen. So now I can scroll through this list and see some of the different commands that are related to oxygen and then either maybe discover a keystroke I didn't know already or assign a keystroke to one that doesn't have one or maybe a keystroke that's more convenient for me. So first of all you're going to notice here's the different calls to oxidizer which allows you to convert code from C Sharp, Delphi, or Java to Oxygen code. And you're going to notice that the C Sharp one has Control Alt V and then C. So this is a two step one. You do Control Alt V and then C, and that's going to invoke the paste C Sharp as Oxygen. Now, if you find yourself um, working more with between Delphi and Oxygen with Prism, then you may choose this option here to have it or assign that keystroke to this one, and then that will make it quicker to do pasting Delphi code into the, the IDE. Uh, some of the other ones that are available here, the um, collect marker, this is a new feature I believe was added in XE. Anytime you, for example, use class completion, which is right here, control shift C, which you're familiar with from Delphi, no doubt, and it jumps down to the implementation of the new class, it will leave a marker, which is a little purple triangle, and then you can use this collect marker to jump back up. So uh, class completion is one example of when a marker is dropped, or pretty much any time the IDE jumps you from one place in the code to another place in the code, it will drop a marker. And so you can use this collect marker to kind of follow your breadcrumbs back to where you were. Very useful feature there. So you can, here you can discover the keystroke for that, or maybe add a different keystroke. Here's drop marker, so they happen automatically, or you can intentionally drop markers. You can create a variable automatically. Just control shift V, it will create a variable for you in line. And then another really useful one here is the implement interface members. Now this doesn't have a keystroke assigned to it, but what it does is if you have a class that you say has an interface, you can use this command to automatically implement the interface members. So I'm going to go ahead and assign a shortcut here. Now, your shortcut has a scope. Now, the default scope is global, which means anywhere in the IDE that'll happen. It doesn't really make sense to have this shortcut, this command happen from anywhere in the IDE because, you know, if I'm over here in the Solution Explorer, what interface do I want to implement? So that doesn't make sense. Instead, I'm going to select Text Editor. This is the most common interf most common scope you're probably going to want to use when you're assigning shortcuts because, frankly, all I think all these commands are related to code. So go ahead and select the scope you want to have, and then we're going to press the keystroke we want to use. Now, I'm going to do Control shift i and then it gives me this Assign button. Now, if I just hit OK here, it didn't assign that. It just left. So make sure you hit Assign. But I also want to point out that if I do um, a second keystroke in here, so Control shift i Control shift alt i Control i then now it's a two-step keystroke, because so I have to hit two different steps in order to invoke that which is a lot of work. Or if I select one that already exists, for example, backspace, then it'll tell you what it's assigned to at that scope. And if I click this drop down, it'll show me other scopes that might have something assigned to it. So let's go ahead and do control, let's see, control I, no. Once you have two and then hit a third one, it erases it. But if you hit the one that's already there, it removes it, which is kind of weird, but it makes sense when you're using it. So now I can see the different scopes that have that keystroke assigned to it. So select a keystroke that isn't in use at your scope or that you don't mind replacing it. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the Control alt shift i just for I know it's not in use and I hit assign. So now it's been assigned and it shows this command that I have selected here has this shortcut assigned to it. So this is where I could remove that shortcut. Now if I replace an existing shortcut, well guess what? You can't get it back that way. You'd have to either remember what it was or re-import the environment settings. So now that I have that shortcut on here, I can say this class clonable. I'm going to implement the clonable interface and then I just do control shift alt i and boom there we go it added the method for clone both here and in the implementation section is ready for me to go. Um, there's also, you can right click on it, and 
here's the implement interface members from there as well and also it'll show you all of your keystrokes you know assigned to different things on here so it added the control shift alt i on there for me so very useful way to discover keystrokes and assign keystrokes it will make yourself more productive when working in visual studio duck typing is a type of dynamic typing where you're not so much concerned with the inheritance or interface of the object but what the object can do so the the mantra is if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck it's a duck i don't care if it doesn't descend from duck or implement duck or whatever if it has these properties and these methods then let's treat it like that so duck typing is a new feature that's added in oxygen xe2 Here's an example of how this would be useful. So right now, I have an interface and a class. Now, we could assume these interfaces and classes are in different units that for, or different assemblies that we don't have access to modify. But for right now, they're all in this single class file. So uh, it's, it's a contrived example, but work with me here. So we have an interface here for iFooBar. And it has two methods, do foo and do bar. And then we have the foobar class. Now I notice this foobar class doesn't implement the ifoobar interface, but it has the same methods in it. Okay, so the fact it doesn't implement the interface is significant. And then we also have the foo class, which just has the do foo method. Okay, so now we come back over here to our program. In our program, we have this method called test. Now test takes an instance of ifoobar and calls the do foo method on it. Okay? Now, I have an instance of the foobar class here, and I'm trying to pass it to test. Now, when I compile, it's not going to work because there's no overloaded method of test that takes a foobar class. Only a class, it needs to be a class that implements ifoobar, which our foobar doesn't implement. Now, the easy solution would be to add I foo bar to this, right? But for the sake of argument, let's assume that we can't do that. So this is where duck typing comes in. So duck typing gives you the opportunity to say, this really implements everything that's in that interface, but it doesn't actually claim to implement that interface. So what we do is we say duck, and then we tell it the type that we want to uh, test or duck, duck type against is I foobar okay so what this does is this looks at this class here foobar class and compares it with this interface and if it implements that interface then it actually passes it as that interface okay so now if I run this we'll compile first and see that it compiles and I'll run it And so here's the main, and then in the do foo, just prints foo. Okay? So that worked. Now what happens if I change this from foobar to a foo? So now it's just a foo. It's not actually foobar. So it doesn't have both methods. It just has one of the methods defined by the ifoobar interface. So now if we hit build, it gives us an error. It says static duct typing failed because of missing methods. So it looked, it compared ifoobar to this class and said, okay, we're missing some of these methods. There is a solution though. We can say duck typing mode weak. Now the default is static. Okay, now if you notice down here in our error message, it says static duck typing failed because of missing methods. If we do weak, then it says only do the types that are it says don't check it basically it says don't check it just go ahead and cast it and so we only want to do weak if we know for a fact that test is only going to call a method that's supported by our type our class here foo okay so in this case foo implements uh the do foo method so we go look foo does in fact implement the do foo method so we know this will work so we can do weak so now if i go ahead and run this we see that it works exactly like we expected. Now, so this is great, but what if you want to be able to get access to this functionality without adding this duck ifoobar all of your code? Well, that's where soft interfaces come in. So soft interfaces, let me go ahead and revert this back to like we had it. 
foobar okay and we notice it will fail to compile because it's expecting something implements ifoobar now let's assume that this class is in an assembly we can't modify but this interface is in our own code and so what we're going to do is we're going to change this interface into a soft interface all right and what this means is this interface is going to basically automatically duct type in order to fit that class. So now if I run this, it's going to test that interface automatically because it's a soft interface and it compiles just fine. So I can run it. And we see main and foo print out just like we expected it to. There we go. That's short introduction to duct typing and soft types, soft interfaces. This may, gives you a way to have, still have the uh, strict type we're used to, but some of the flexibility of a dynamically typed language and to be able to do duct typing. Futures are a really amazing data type. Basically, what a future does is it says, "I want to get this value, have this value sometime in the future." So you see right here. I am uh, declaring a future string f, and it gets the value from get foo. Okay, so get foo, all it does is writes to the console when it is getting foo. So this is when foo is calculated, which in this case foo is just a string, but assume this was a complex calculation that took some time. Okay, so I'm saying in the future, I'm going to want to read this value. Okay, so we're going to outline, out right line, start. We're going to assign this get foo to string to f, and then we're going to write line assigned. We're going to have a read key just for a pause, and they're say before read and write line f. Now, without the future, we'll run this. And we see it says start, and then right here we say get foo, it says getting foo, and then before read foo. Okay, so it's very linear what happens here. Now we're going to make this future, and we'll run it again. Okay, so we say start and assign. Now notice the getting foo hasn't appeared yet, and that's because we haven't actually calculated the value of foo. And the reason is because this is a synchronous future, which means this future is only calculated when it's needed. So it's not going to be calculated until we go to read the value of the future here. So I'm going to hit enter in the console application and you'll see it's going to say before read and then it's going to say getting foo and an output foo. Before read here and then as soon as it goes to read foo that's when getting foo gets called and then we get the value of foo back. Okay, so that's a future. Basically, a future says, I may, it's a great way to delay initialization of things. If you may or may not need this, or you don't want to calculate it until you need it, then a future is a good thing to use there. Now, probably what's even cooler is the asynchronous futures. Okay, so this was a synchronous future, which means it's calculated in the current thread. So I can use ASYNC, make it an asynchronous future. And that means the call to get foo happens asynchronously, all right? So it's going to happen in another thread sometime before it's needed, okay? Now, if it gets down here to read the value and it hasn't been spawned in another thread yet because the CPU's been really busy, at that point it'll block and then it will calculate it. Now, this is a really powerful way to increase the responsiveness of your application because you can initialize all this stuff as asynchronous futures, all these expensive calls you have as asynchronous futures, and then they will be calculated sometime before you need them. Now it may be calculated immediately when you need it, or it may be calculated when the CPU is idle automatically. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and run this and see it start and then assign so this line was printed out first, and then we called get it got getting foo. And the reason is, is because on this read key, all of a sudden our application is idle. And so it's like, hey, we're not doing anything else. We might as well get the value of foo now in case we need it later. 
All right, so then I go ahead and hit the carriage return before read, and then there's a value of foo. So asynchronous features are a really powerful way to increase the responsiveness of your application by saying, I may or I will need this in the future, calculate it when I'm not busy, and then the compiler takes care of it all for you. Now this uses the parallel extension framework that's built into .NET 4 in order to create the optimum number of threads and stuff like that. So it, it's very optimized, very highly optimized, but you don't have to worry about it is the great thing. You just do this and it happens. Now of course you do need to be smart and then not have some sort of side effect that's caused by this because if there's a side effect in here and you're expecting that side effect here before it's calculated, that side effect may or may not have happened yet. So you need to be smart in how you architect it, but if you're smart in how you architect it and there's no side effects, then it will all just work smoothly. I'm sure we're all familiar with the for loop. In this case, it's going to go from 0 to 10 and print out the values of each one of those. So it's a, it's a sequential loop that goes over a set number of values. If I run this right now, we'll see that sure enough there's the values from 0 to 10 output just like we'd expect. And now you notice in here I have a, a thread sleep and that's just going to simulate a process that takes a little bit longer than immediate because a right line, let's face it, that's quick. So I'm going to show you a parallel for loop. Now a parallel for loop is great when you don't care about the order that the iterations happen in, and there's no side effects between each iteration. Also, you can't have a call to exit in here as well because that would cause problems because of the fact it's going to be put in multiple threads. So if those three criteria are met, then a parallel loop is a great way to take advantage of the multiple cores that are in people's processors today. So I'm going to go ahead and run this now. And observe the order that they're in. So we notice it goes 0, 5, 6, 1. So that is because it spawned multiple threads because the first iteration, well it did the zero iteration, but then the second it was taking a while so it start, went ahead and paused the next iteration or spawned the next iterations as well and those all happened simultaneously. So there was multiple threads going here and some finished before others. Now, one thing to keep in mind is the order you, The order can't matter. So it could run these all in order depending on other characteristics about CPU load, etc. So this, don't always assume it's going to be random, but once you make it parallel, you can't always assume it's going to be sequential either. So that's a parallel for loop, a good way to take advantage of the multiple threads that are available on a system. So I'm going to show you a few really useful features here. Um, to set this up, I'm going to point out that I have a class here called node that has a name and a value and then a next which points to another node class. Okay, so essentially it's, it's a node and a linked list. And I've gone ahead and constructed three of them here. And I'm using extended constructor syntax because you notice there's no constructor on here. And so by just passing the name and a value as if it was going to a constructor, it initializes these for me automatically, which is really useful for situations like this. So now I'm going to go ahead and go to the head and say give me the next and the name of that. So if I run this it's going to give me body, right? So we'll run it. And it says body, just like we'd expect. Now that's all fine and good, but if I go to tail and say dot next dot name, well Next, uh, tails next is nil. So if I run this, I get a null reference exception. So short of interrogating the next on the tail to determine if it's nil before calling name, how can I deal with this? Let me show you. This is where the colon operator comes in. The colon operator says, get me next, or get it, calls, so it only gets the value instead of the dot operator, always gets the value, but it only gets it if this is assigned. Okay, so if tail, next, or name is nil, then this value will be nil. 
So in this case, tail is always going to be assigned, but we don't know, for example, if next is going to be assigned. So if next is nil, then we get a nil back in name. If text is not nil, then we get back the value of name. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and leave it the colons all the way across. So what this allows for is if any of these are nil, then I get back nil for the name. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and run this. And you see back, now it says we have null. Now you may have looked ahead here and saw in this right line line, and this is using an if expression. So now in a XE2, we introduced expressions where the expressions return values. So this if expression, re the name is what's returned, otherwise null is returned. So it evaluates this and returns this or that based on the value of that. So this lets you put expressions like values. It's really quite powerful and pretty amazing what you can do with it to make your code a lot more concise. So, what if I want to get the value instead of the name? So I've got value here, and let's go ahead and specifically give this a type instead of using a, a assumed type. I'm going to say integer. So what happens if I run the compile this now? I get a compile error. Oh, let's change this to value. Value. Okay. And of course, I have to use the right case. Well, it's a hint. You can turn that off. That's what it gets me most times. It's like misspell my, or not misspell, but I give the case wrong, and I get wonderful hints about that. Okay, there we go. This all compiles correctly, and we'll run it. And we got zero back because this is nil. So in this case, value is just a regular integer. Now, we could say nullable integer. And now we're saying is that this is a nullable integer, so it may have a value or it may be nil. And so now when we run this, we see we got back a null. So we've seen colon operators, extended constructor syntax, nullable types, and value expressions. A lot of PRISM users have an existing Delphi code base that they'd like to work with in PRISM. Now there's a couple ways of doing that. One of the ways you can do that is you can come in here and I have a, created an empty class file here. I'm just going to right click and go to Oxidizer and say paste Delphi132 as Oxygen. And this has done some of the changes necessary in order to make Delphi Win32 code, or I guess Delphi 64 code, work in Oxygen. Now if I go ahead and hit, we can see for example, it says Dane space instead of unit there as an example. If I go ahead and hit build, it's going to give me a couple of error messages. For example, sysutils is in users list. Um, there's no create static create method on the constructor. Now I can come in here and fix these. and build it and now it'll work in Prism. But sometimes you want to maintain, have the same code work between both your Delphi and your Prism. For example, if it's shared code. Well, you can do that as well. So what I'm gonna do is instead, I'm gonna, one of the ways you can do that is you can come in here to go properties and we have this backwards compatibility tab. So, this allows you to come on and turn on some backwards compatibility behavior. Now this is only recommended if there's a situation where you want to have shared code between Delphi and Prism. If you are if you want to fork your code and move it into Prism, we suggest you actually edit that code and make it work with the Prism syntax. But if you need to maintain the code to work in both Delphi and Prism, then you need to come in here and enable some of these. So we're going to go ahead and turn all these on for now and instead of doing the oxidizer paste delphi when 32 is oxygen instead i'm just going to hit paste okay so now we see instead we have a unit and a few other other changes are going to be different so i'm going to go ahead and hit build and it says unknown names sysutils and uses list so the rest of the stuff was actually able to figure out around 
So how do we fix that? Well, actually, we can use uh, if def, if not def in this case, and we just say .net. If it's not .net, then do that. And now this uses clause will be ignored for .net. So now the same code, because the only change I made was to put this if def on it, will work in Delphi and in .net. So you can, of course, add um, other if defs, or for example, just do an if def instead of if dot def if you have code that's specific to your Prism implementation or specific to run on Prism versus Delphi. The, for example, if you have a type that is has a different name in Delphi versus in .NET, for example, if you're using like a, a generic collection, in Delphi it's T list of T, in .NET it's just list of T. So you could create an alias type that points to that, calling it T list of T if you wanted to in Prism, and then just set up a if def.net create that alias type otherwise use the existing type so that way you can have some functionality where you can share the same code between both Delphi and .NET uh, you can also do Java if you're using uh, oxygen for Java and you want to share code across all three so you can use uh, .NET Java or then the reverse of those would be in Delphi One thing that's kind of cool is you see how this grays out. So it's not, since it's not Java, then this is enabled. But then when I go to .NET, it gets grayed out. So that makes it really easy to know what's going to run and what's not going to run. Kind of cool. So you see when I run this here, you can see it does output the solution to Nicholas Worth's solution to the eight queens problem. I want to give you a real quick intro to Oxyscator. Now you recognize this is the stack example I used in class contracts earlier. And down here I have running the dot peak utility from JetBrains. It's a dot net decompiler. And you'll see it has the git is empty, git is empty, it has all the methods, even the private methods, are visible through decompilation here. So I'm going to show you how to use Oxyscator. If you want to protect your intellectual property in your application, you just come in here and say add new project and you just select Rem Objects Oxyscator. And the easiest way is to add it to your solution, but you can also create projects that are part of your build because it's totally integrated with MS build or any other way you want to do this. But the key is you come in here and say assemblies to obfuscate and you say add reference and you select the assembly that you want to obfuscate. Okay. And then once this one builds, the building of this causes it to obfuscate the other assembly. Now there's a number of preferences you can come in here and configure. But we won't do those now. I'm just going to go into the folder here to where it obfuscated that. And go into dot peak. Let's remove the old one. And come back in here and add this obfuscated one. And if I dig into this, we see that the names have all been replaced with just individual letters. Now what that does, it makes it really hard to understand what the code does because all of the identifiers have been removed or obfuscated. Um, so anyway, that's a real quick introduction to Oxyscator. It comes with uh, Oxygen for .NET, which is of course in Delphi Prism. If you do find yourself with Delphi code and .NET code, whether it be Oxygen from Delphi Prism or any other .NET code, that you need to have these two sides working together, this managed and non-managed code bases working together with the highest level of cohesion, then I'm going to recommend you take a look at Hydra. Hydra is a 
tool framework available from Room Object Software that allows you to build plugins in either Delphi or .NET and then have those plugins hosted by an application built in either Delphi or .NET. So that means you can mix a .NET plugin in a Delphi application or vice versa, a Delphi plugin in a .NET application. And it gives you just the absolute best, highest level of cohesion between those two sides so that you can have the best of both worlds. You can have all the features of .NET in your Delphi application or all the features of Delphi in your .NET application. It works with Silverlight, uh, WPF, WinForms, visual, non-visual components. It works with uh, FireMonkey, the latest version of Delphi, older versions of Delphi. It, pretty much anywhere you're going to want to go with this, you can use Hydra to get it all to come together. So instead of having to choose between .NET and Delphi, between Prism and Delphi, you never have to choose again. You can just say, this application is written in what makes most sense for me, and each feature is implemented in what platform makes most sense. So if you have some features that make more sense in Delphi, do those features in Delphi. Some features make more sense in .NET, you do those features in .NET. And when you're all done, you bring it all together into one application, and it's good to go. So the way this works is here you see that I have a WPF visualization. So this is a plugin that's going to be plugged into into the Delphi host application. Um, behind the WPF code here is the oxygen code that powers this application. And the secret to making this all work together is a interface. Now this interface defines what is visible from our .NET assembly into our Delphi application here. So then we go into Delphi. And there's actually a tool here under the Hydra menu option that will import the interface for us automatically and create this interface here. So this interface maps to the interface we had in .NET. And then we write our application and we just create a post or create a place for our application to host this plugin. So you see there's nothing in this area of the application now, but as soon as I run this, we see it's loaded up this .NET visualization plugin into our Delphi host application. Now at this point, to the user's point of view, it's completely seamless. They resize this, it all resizes exactly like they expected to. They click a button here, it interacts with the plugin. Great stuff here. If you're using Delphi and .NET, you really need to take a look at this because adding Hydra to your tool chain means that it doesn't matter what requirement comes up or what the future brings you're always going to be able to take advantage of the latest, greatest stuff from Delphi and bring in some feature that you need to have in .NET, whatever it happens to be. There you go. Now you can put them both together, the best of both worlds, and get to market faster. You know, leverage what you got, keep going, get the job done. Who cares what platform you're using, right? You're going to see, in addition to the usual templates available here under Oxygen for .NET, I also have a new Metro group here. Inside there, I can choose a regular Metro application, a grid application, or a Metro class library. We're going to go ahead and stick to a Metro application here and just say Oxygen Metro 1. This is open our new project up here. And Metro is based on XAML, so I'm going to go here to the main page XAML, and I'm just going to put down a text box, which is lets user enter text. A little button here they can click, and a text block, which is just display some text. I'm going to go ahead and change the font size on all of these. And line that back up there. Now by default in here, these items that I've added don't have names. So if you look over here in the uh, property screen, you see the name is, says no name. And so that means you can't reference it from code. But since I want to be able to reference these from code to get the value out of here, I'm going to call this one enter text and this one. displayed text. Now the button, I don't have to give it a name because I'm never actually going to reference it from code, but I do want to handle the click event, and so I'm going to do that by just double clicking on the button here. And then come in here, add some text, so I'm going to say this 
display text dot text equals entered text dot text and that should be ready to run now metro apps run full screen this is the loading screen and here's our app it's up and running and I can come in here and type hello hit the button and it displays it down there so nice little simple metro app if you want to go back to Visual Studio it's up here in the corner you can actually also take this and do the uh, partial view although it works better if you're doing metro apps instead of desktop apps desktop is apps that just shows you the different apps this is for debugging purposes here for my metro app but if you had other metro apps they could you could take one of those and mount it here on the side and have this partial view and then get rid of it and go back to the view you're on before also if we go to our home screen we'll see that we now have our new oxygen powered metro app gets automatically added to the home screen so there you go a um, little short introduction to metro app development using oxygen for .NET and visual studio 2011 This is just a touch of what's new in PRISM and what's available in PRISM XE2. If you would like more information, check out wiki.oxygenlanguage.com for the latest documentation on PRISM and the Oxygen language that powers it. Also check out rimobjects.com slash TV slash oxygen for more videos about oxygen. Do register your serial number if you haven't already done so with RIM objects, and that gives you access to the latest beta builds. And then you can, for example, get this and run it in Windows 8 under Visual Studio 11 and start doing Metro development. Thanks for your time, and I look forward to seeing all the fabulous new development you'll be doing with Embarcadero Prism XE2.